Good morning. This is take two. I just record recorded the entire discussion and it didn't work. <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to try this one more time. Uh, I may or may not make it to the meeting on time, but that's okay because more important is that you guys get this discussion of scaling and non-dimensionalizing. Um, so really this is an extension of what we did last time. However, what we're going to do is we're going to extend this so that you can use non-dimensionalization to say something intelligent about unknown problems. And it turns out this has been done quite a bit. This is the way that we got most of our useful non-dimensional numbers. Uh, so for example, the Reynolds number or the Froude number. We got them by following the technique or people following the technique that we'll describe today. And so this is non-dimensionalizing and scaling. Start off with spiritual thought by President Henry V. Eyring. He said, when prayer works as it should, we express the feelings of our hearts in simple words. Heavenly Father typically answers by putting thoughts in our minds accompanied by feelings. He always hears the sincere prayer we offer when we pray with a commitment to obey him, whatever his answer and whenever it comes. Can I tell you, I am so grateful and I testify to you that this is absolutely true. If you ever doubt it, try it. Heavenly Father will hear and he will answer. Sometimes because of our emotional state or because of our actions, it's difficult to hear that response, but he will hear and he will answer, even if the answer is no. I told you before, I think, when we moved to Westinghouse, I told my wife, don't worry, I know you don't want to move to Pittsburgh from Boston, but I promise you will only be there five years. I should really be careful about writing checks I can't cash, but <laughs> turns out, thankfully, I was right, but for a different location. When we were, she wanted to go to China. She lived in China for study abroad and absolutely loved it. And so once five years uh, had passed, I had just six months earlier applied for a position in China where I'd be overseeing the construction and the development and the licensing of the nuclear plants that Westinghouse was building in China. And I got the job. Great benefits, great opportunity. Adoption would have been easier. We would have tripled our take-home pay. I mean, good opportunity. And we went home and prayed about it. And about halfway through my sentence, very clearly the impression came that that was not where I was supposed to be, that the Lord did not want me in China at that time. And about the same time that I felt that impression, I heard my wife do this funny laugh cry. And I knew that she had gotten the same impression. And so when I finished the prayer, I asked, what are your thought? And breaking down, she said, it wasn't right. We're not supposed to go. And it was tough to accept that no answer. Until a couple months later, when we did get a phone call from BYU offering us the job at BYU. So clearly, the Lord has a plan for us. He knows each of you personally. And I know that he knows exactly where he wants us to be, to do the most good, and to be the most happy. And prayer is a wonderful way for us to understand and to know his will. So looking at the roadmap, we're still doing dimensional analysis. When I get back Friday, we will be talking about fluid systems, and we'll talk about laminar versus turbulent flow and friction, and kind of coming up with how to derive that friction fudge factor that we talked about a couple times ago. Okay? First of all, as it is a Wednesday, let's get into the open-ended problem. Whoops. 
You know, thinking about that and watching that clip, it's probably a good thing nobody has developed a flux capacitor. Otherwise, people driving in Utah would have disrupted the timeline a long time ago. Anyways, great Scott, reaching 88 miles per hour is crucial to time travel, as the brilliant Doc Brown has discovered. However, back in 1885, the only means he had of accelerating his DeLorean time machine was to use a steam engine locomotive. In order to make sure that this would work, since if it didn't, they'd be in for a long free fall into a deep ravine, he decided to build a scale model, primarily to ensure that the drag forces on the train wouldn't preclude reaching 88 miles per hour. How fast should the model train be moving in order to ensure similarity between the model and the actual attempt at reaching 88 miles per hour? Okay, and then there are a few other steps that I won't go over here. Something to note, you don't yet know how to calculate drag force, so I have given you the drag forces for the problem. And then there's asking questions about the acceleration burst and the force associated with it on Clara and on the rod and on Doc Brown's hand, all these kinds of things to consider. And then, of course, just a quick glimpse at kinematics to see if this was a possibility. So, I want to do another pi group example just to make sure we're clear on that. And the example we're going to use here is a falling sphere. So what we're going to do is we're going to recognize the parameters that are here and try and come up with a, the pi groups associated with this physical correlation. So we have z, and we have time, we have g, but then we also have a couple other things. There's an initial velocity associated with this. In other words, if the sphere is already moving when we start the analysis, we need to account for that speed. And then finally, there's going to be some initial position. We need to figure out where it ends up. Z is going to be dependent upon where it initially was, Z naught. So that gives us five parameters. Z, T, G, Z naught, and V naught. So the units are actually only two units. Uh, some various combinations of meters and seconds. I should say, I say units. Really, I should say there's two dimensions to this problem, and the units are meters and seconds. So what is n? How many parameters do we have? Well, that's five. How many different units do we have? Or in other words, what's j? That's two. So what does that say about our pi groups? The number of pi groups is five minus two. That equals three. So there are th three pi groups, one dependent pi group, or in other words, the pi group that we're trying to, uh, that is on the left side of the equation, and there's two independent pi groups. Okay, so let's do this by inspection. If we were to come back up here, there is one choice that makes a lot of sense because they already have the same units, and that's z and z naught. If we were to divide one by the other, we would end up with a very simple pi number, and that's what we do for the first one, z over z naught, or the amount of distance relative to the initial position that has been covered. Okay. By doing the same kind of inspection, we start with time and figure out that in order to get time on the bottom, we'll need to have velocity divided by the distance traveled. Now, I mentioned before that pi numbers are not unique. That is still true. In this case, we could use z instead of z naught. That will also non-dimensionalize it, so it's a valid pi group. However, both of them work, so you, pi numbers are not unique, but they do take into account the dependence of variables. So then we need to do the last number, which involves g. So we start with g, which is in units of meters per second. So let's start easy and divide that by velocity, and that gives us 1 over second. So an easy way to take care of that would be to multiply it by velocity over, or I'm sorry, time over, uh, velocity over length, or in other words, uh, dividing by that. So in other words, multiplying by z naught over v naught, that will give us the third pi group of g z naught over v naught squared. And that is ultimately the third pi group. Now that one is significant. If we look at this pi group, if we take that the square root of this pi group and flip it, so that pi group to the minus one half, that gives us the Froude number, which is a ratio of... Um, forces acting on that sphere, and an important number to know whenever you're dealing with falling uh, particles or droplets or fluids. So let's move on to the non-dimensionalizing part. The homework today is going to be just one single non-dimensionalized problem, uh, the web problem is, 
They're complicated, they look scary, but they're not that bad. It really comprises three steps, and I'm going to show an example problem today about doing that. Um, but first, something to note. Let's look at an example problem. Here we have units of kilogram per meter cube per second for each of those terms. I've written to the right what that looks like. Uh, the density is kilogram per meter cube, the time is seconds. And then on the right term, it's kilogram per meter cube times meters per second for rho b, and then 1 over meters, which gives us the same units of kilograms per meter cube per second. And then what we want to do is we want to make sure that each term unit, or no, that each term in this equation has the same units. That must be true or it's not a valid equation. This is a common math cat error when you're working with units, that the units do, don't match between the two additive quantities. So make sure they have the same unit, and then what you do is you cancel the units. You non-dimensionalize the equation by dividing the entire equation by some quantity with the same unit. So in this case, it would be really easy to simply divide the whole equation by rho over t. So if we have here uh, t over rho, times t over rho, suddenly this equation is non-dimensional. Okay? So a couple things to review. Remember, nature doesn't recognize units. It recognizes fundamental properties or fundamental dimensions. So kilograms versus pounds, meters versus miles, seconds versus hours. In a system, there's no awareness of this differentiation. That's strictly something we came up with so we can conceptually understand the problem. It makes sense to us when somebody says, that's about five miles down the road, right? Rather than saying that's half the length of the road, that's kind of how we work because it makes sense to us. Or that's five feet away from a person. That gives us an immediate understanding of the relative scope. But in nature, what's more important is natural scales, or in other words, relationships. So let's say that we are in a 10 meter square room and there's a fly that enters the room, and we want to describe how far that fly travels into the room. Let's say the fly travels five meters into the room. There's a couple different ways we could analyze that. We could say the fly has traveled five meters into the room. That's kind of our nice way to understand conceptually what's happening. Another way that we could say it is that the fly has traveled halfway into the room. What we've done there is we've taken the distance the fly has traveled and divided it by the length of the room. We still understand, and certainly it makes sense mathematically, that the fly has traveled five meters or halfway across the room. But that's the way that it's registered often in nature is relative scales. In other words, one quantity relative to another. Why do we even bring this up? Because this is a good frame of reference to use for non-dimensionalizing equations. Okay? We want to make sure that we're, for example, not dividing some atomic scale problem by meters because then meters are so far above the scale of atoms that we'll end up with erroneously small numbers. And that's because of our units that we've assigned. However, if we assign the total length of some lattice structure by the distance across that an atom travels, that gives us a reasonable scale. And so when we're doing non-dimensional analysis, it's important to remember scales and relative numbers. And we're going to use that for the process. So why do we even do non-dimensionalization? Why am I bringing this up to you? Well, it turns out that by doing non-dimensionalization, we can figure out something intelligent about a problem without ever solving the problem. And the example we're going to use is how long to cook a roast. This is a big question that many people come up with, and there's a few different ways we could figure this out. We could do trial and error, which means we vary the size of the roast and the time and the temperature. We adjust all these different parameters, do several runs for each one of those variants, put it all together after doing a thousand experiments and wasting a lot of roast and figuring out the relationship between time, size, and temperature. That's awfully complicated. And it's awfully expensive. You're going to be throwing away or eating a lot of roast. I guess once you have teenage kids, maybe that's a reasonable approach. But until then, uh, that's, that's an expensive way to go. Another thing we can do is approximate the geometry and properties and solve the heat transfer problem. Also complicated, and in a lot of cases, difficult. Because we have a um, complicated equation that takes some serious effort to solve, particularly in three dimensions.
Another thing we could do is we could set up CFD, computational fluid dynamics, and solve a complicated numerical solution. We'll get a reasonable answer, but again, expense is an issue. In this case, instead of just time and money, it's time. It takes a long time to run these calculations sometimes. And so those are some of the approaches we could take, and all of them take more time and effort than we want to put into this problem, because we just want to know how the cook time varies with the mass of the roast. So if we look at the cookbook, maybe that's a good approach. Look at what people have done before. Unfortunately, simple instructions say that you should cook the roast for 20 minutes a pound. Now let me tell you, as one who's cooked many roasts, the bigger that roast gets, the more inaccurate this instruction is. You begin to overcook the roast and it gets all dried out. Same with the steak. You'll get a very well done steak when you're aiming for medium. There are uh, some more sophisticated instructions since it doesn't make sense just to scale up time directly. For example, at OChef.com it says if you roast at 325 Fahrenheit, subtract two minutes or so per pound if the roast is refrigerated. Just before going into the oven, add two or three minutes per pound. That doesn't sound very simple, does it? So that's not necessarily an adequate representation for what we want to do. So what we're going to do is look at the heat equation and non-dimensionalize the heat equation and show you the solution to the heat equation to get this answer, to figure out how we can scale the cooking time of the roast with the size of the roast. So in, in other words, if we were to look at this, if we were to put this in equation form, we're saying that the cooking time is directly proportional to the mass. In other words, if the mass increases linearly, then we'll increase the cooking time linearly. They are directly proportional. That's what the cookbook is telling us. Common sense says that that's not quite the case. And instructions that are more sophisticated reflect that this isn't quite the case, but their relationship is oblique at best. So, let's look at the heat equation. You'll learn this next semester, so don't worry about knowing this. But the gradient of heat with time, or the change in, in temperature with time, is equal to the gradient of the temperature across the distance. Uh, the Laplacian, the double gradient. Okay? We're going to simplify this by saying that the roast is a symmetric cube of length L. That's the total length of the roast, or the total scale of this problem. And we're going to say that it's symmetric, so therefore we can reduce the heat equation down to just a single term. Okay? And in this case, alpha relates to the thermal conductance. It's, again, a ratio of important forces, the uh, thermal conductivity of the material divided by the volumetric heat capacity of the material. In other words, the ratio of the heat transfer forces over the heat retention forces. Remember, those dimensionless numbers are usually ratios of important forces and parameters. So if we were to solve this equation explicitly, we would get this relationship. Or in other words, at time zero, this is the temperature profile hot on the surface, but still cold in the center. And as time progresses, we move up the curves until eventually at some long time, by the way, I'm sorry, that shouldn't be temperature, that should be time. At some long time, we end up getting um, the uh, uniform temperature distribution inside the roast. I, I don't like autocorrect. That should be little t zero. I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> so again, if we solve the unsteady heat equation using the assumptions we mentioned before that the properties are constant, they have to be constant if we do this approach, and that the three-dimensional Cartesian coordinates can be simplified by symmetry, then this is the solution that we get. Keep in mind that each of these terms in the equation has dimensional homogeneity. They each have the same units. Okay? And they also have the same dimensions. We're not talking about uh, thousands of temperatures for this, thousands of degrees centigrade for this temperature, and tens of Fahrenheit for this temperature. That would not make sense. They have dimensional homogeneity and the same units. Okay? In other words, we have uh, the thermal conductivity, the density, the heat capacity, and the alpha. And when you multiply those together, each term has the same units. So that takes a lot of time and effort to solve this equation. Let's say we don't want to solve the equation, we just want to examine it. Can we look at this equation and say something about the cooking time scales? Well, we know there's a time in the uh, denominator of the, in, of the differential here. But it's really tough to say anything intelligent about how that time 
changes with the problem. This is the heart of what we want to do. We want to look at this equation without solving it. We want to adjust it so we know something intelligent about how the different parameters are related to each other. And that's what we're going to do with the non-dimensionalization. We're going to non-dimensionalize the equation, then we'll scale it, then we'll investigate it. Okay, so let's start with the heat equation. And what we want to do is we want to come up with some um, multiple uh, some constant that we multiply this uh, ratio by to make it non-dimensional. And same with this side. And so what we're going to do to make the most simple use of this problem is we're going to pick arbitrary reference quantities. These are constants that represent the scale of the problem. So in this case, when we're talking about cooking a roast, we don't want the temperature to be a few degrees Fahrenheit. That's out of the scale of this problem. It's two orders of magnitude less than where it should be at 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's not do that. Secondly, uh, when we pick the length, we don't want it to be a few angstroms. That's also out of the scale. And we also don't want it to be a few miles. That doesn't make sense when we're talking about cooking a roast. So we're going to pick a constant quantity, T ref, L, and tau. This is the time scale that are within the range of the problem and we're going to create non-dimensional parameters. So in other words, we're going to divide the time that's passed by the time scale reference. Remember, this is a constant to come up with T star. We're going to do the same thing for temperature. We're going to divide the temperature we're at, divide it by some reference temperature that's at the right scale called T ref. And then we're going to divide the distance we're traveling in the roast by the total length of the roast, or, or sorry, some arbitrary length scale, which, spoiler, is going to be the length of the roast. And we're going to come up with x star. Then what we're going to do is we're going to solve for the original variable. Why do we do that? Because then we're going to substitute that into the equation. So instead of having temperature in this equation, because it's equal to our reference temperature times T star, we're going to plug this quantity in for temperature. We're going to plug this quantity here in for time. We're going to plug this quantity in for x. Okay, so we haven't changed anything. All we've done is we've picked some arbitrary reference and said that the original variable divided by that reference is equal to T star and then solve for the original variable and come up with a quantity that's exactly the same as the original quantity. It's almost like playing make-believe, but it's important to do. When we do that, we come up with this equation. And because of what we've done here, this is now uh, an equation that has quantities that are uh, differentials, and then we have equation references based on our non-dimensionalized reference quantities. Okay, then what we do, we simplify the problem by dividing through by this reference. When we do that, we turn it into a non-dimensional equation, right? Because what are the units on this portion. There's zero. In essence, what we've done is we've taken the units out of the differential through this process. Do you see that? Now we have a unitless temperature, a unitless time, because they're relative scales. This is the time relative to our reference. Sorry, this is the time relative to our reference. This is the temperature relative to our reference. Now this term is the one that has the units temperature per time. And that's the same as these units, temperature per time. So if we divide both sides by T ref over tau, we end up with a unitless equation. Okay, do you see that? The nice thing is, though, we now have this coefficient. And this coefficient is what will tell us something intelligent about the problem. First, we want to make sure we have the right scales, and we'll do that in the next slide. But notice that there are no more dimensions in this equation. This is what we mean when we say non-dimensionalization. So we start with some reference constant quantities, we plug, or we come up with a dimensionless variable by dividing our regular variable by the dimensionless variable, and then we solve and substitute into this equation. Once we do that, we divide by one of the coefficients to get a perfectly dimensionless equation. Okay. A quick note, this group right here, alpha tau over L squared, is a dimensionless group called the Fourier number. It's a ratio of the physical time to the characteristic diffusion time. And I mentioned that this is how we came up with a lot of our dimensionless numbers, is by doing this non-dimensionalization process to come up with coefficients that mean something important. And it turns out that those 
unitless numbers are important enough that we use them to measure regular phenomena, like the Reynolds number. I talked a lot about last time how that's so important for flow. We derive that by doing this dimension, non-dimensionalization process. So now we've discovered that the Fourier number is an important number when it comes to heat transfer. So next semester when you're doing heat transfer and you talk about the Fourier number, you can feel proud to know that you have figured out how to get that via non-dimensionalizing of the heat equation. Actually, you probably won't even care or remember, but still. Okay. Next, we need to make sure that we have the right scale on our units. Book's a little confusing here, as are most books in this case. They call it no normalization. Literally, all we're trying to do is that we don't have a faux pas like we did with the um, uh, example that I gave earlier about how you're trying to measure a road by angstroms. That makes no sense. Or measuring atoms by meters because then you'll end up with the wrong scale and the units will screw that up. So when we're doing the reference variables, the length reference, the temperature reference, the time scale, what we want to do is make sure that they are of the same order as these parentheticals. Okay, So if these parentheticals are order of unity, for example, they come close to 1, then we want to make sure that the term in the brackets also comes close to 1. So we make that assumption just very quickly. We assume that this is close to 1, this is close to 1, and we put in length scales such that this would be equal to 1 as well. Okay. So in other words, the first thing is logically it makes sense that L is the domain size, or in this case the length of the roast. Okay. Remember we assumed a cube, this is the length. We will not see a length larger than L. And we're likely not going to parse it so small that L makes no sense because L is the size of the row. So that's what we will pick for our arbitrary length is we'll just pick the domain size. That ensures that this equation correlates to the phenomenon happening on that domain. Okay. Then what we do is remember we assume that these are order 1. So we want this to be equal to order 1. So if we set this term equal to 1, then we get that tau is equal to the length squared over the alpha. That is our time scale. Okay? So that's what we do in order to make sure that we are scaled appropriately. As we assume that these are order 1, and we set this equal to order 1 and solve for the other scale, which in this case is the time scale. So we find out that this is a function of the length scale and the time scale. These are the characteristic scales of the problem. Or in other words, it's like saying halfway across the room. That way when we do this problem, instead of coming up with some arbitrary number, it's like saying that we are halfway across the room or halfway across the roast. Or the time is halfway to where it would be for, a, for full cooking of the roast. Okay. So what we do instead of saying meters, we say the roast size or the fraction of time required to cook the whole roast as an example. Now the book kind of describes this, but it's a little confusing. This is Lennon Singal. Uh, in the process of scaling, one attempts to select intrinsic reference quantities so that each term in the dimensionless equations transforms into the product of a consistent factor which closely estimates the term's order of magnitude and a dimensionless factor of unit order of magnitude. Yeah, that just says what I just said, really, is that you're dividing through by the same units, and then you're trying to make this coefficient unity order of magnitude. Okay? Or in other words, order of magnitude 1. Once we do that, we can now say something intelligent about cooking a roast. So we learned from the previous step that the time scale scales with L squared. You see that? Time scale is here. It scales with L squared. Okay. But if we think about mass, the mass scales with L cubed. We're dealing with a cube, so if you multiply L by L by L, that gives you the volume which is related to mass. Okay, So if we do L cubed times density, we get mass. In other words, the time scale is proportional to L squared. The mass is proportional to L cubed. So if we rearrange this second one to solve for L, L is proportional to, one, to mass to the one-third. If we plug this back into the original, we get that the time scale is proportional to mass to the two-thirds. And that's what we get right here. Time scale is proportional to mass to the two-thirds. Well, what does this mean? In the cookbook, they claimed that time scales scaled with a mass. Remember, they said add 20 minutes for every pound. 
that's not accurate. We found out from this dimensional analysis, just from looking at this coefficient here and looking at the units and what they mean, that in reality, the cooking time scales with mass to the two-thirds, not with mass to the first. Okay, So here, we didn't solve anything, but now we know something valuable about the problem. We know that cooking time scales with mass to the two-thirds. We now, without any experiments, without any solution, know about how long to cook a roast based on the mass. Okay, And the neat thing about this is if we know the cooking time for one roast, we can extrapolate to another because what we found is relationship among the parameters themselves. We didn't figure out specifically to this roast, this is how long it needs to be cooked. That's what you get when you solve an equation for a roast of a particular size. And then what you have to do is you have to adjust that equation for a different shape or size roast, where here we can scale this for any roast of any shape so long as we follow the relationship that the cook time is proportional to mass to the two-thirds. So if we look at this, this is why I severely overcook roasts if I use the cookbook instructions because that represents a time that's linear, whereas in reality it is related to the mass of two-thirds. So you get almost double the cook time once you get up to a larger roast. Okay, So this is the power of non-dimensionalization, is if you don't have the know-how or the capability or the time and money to solve an equation or do detailed experiments, we can still figure out something about the relationships. So for your homework today, we're going to talk about, or I'm going to give you a problem called the boundary layer problem. So basically what's going to happen when we do the Lagrangian method, we're going to figure out that just like in the problem with uh, the two plates flowing, remember the two plates flowing, or two plates parallel to each other and the flowing fluid, and one plate was not moving and so it had a velocity of zero, and the fluid next to it had a velocity of zero, and the other plate was moving at velocity v, and the fluid right next to it had a velocity v, and there was a profile. Well, a boundary layer is similar to that. When you have some fluid like wind blowing over some surface like a table or a desk or a lake, then you're going to have that same thing happen where there's going to be some velocity gradient between the lake surface and between, or the desk surface and between the bulk wind velocity. And we call that a boundary layer. It's a very complicated equation that describes the boundary layer. So what I'm going to do is have you non-dimensionalize the boundary layer so that you can say something intelligent about how the parameters are changing. For example, what's the thickness of the boundary layer as a function of the length of the plate or how far you've traveled along the length? Or, for example, what's the thickness of the boundary layer as a function of the velocity of the wind? Things like this. So without solving that very complicated, ugly boundary layer equation, you're going to be able to say something intelligent about the thickness of the boundary layer or that uh, height from v not, or v equals 0 to v just based on certain key parameters in the problem. Okay, So that's what that web problem is going to be attempting to do. So another thing about non-dimensionalization, it also reduces the number of parameters by showing that they aren't independent. For example, you notice temperature didn't show up here. It's because it's not independent. Temperature also impacts the alpha or the rate of heat transfer. And so it's not an independent parameter, so we don't need to worry about varying it. That's one of the other nice things about non-dimensionalization is it reveals which parameters are independent in changing the problem. Okay. So in other words, if we're looking at this problem of cooking the roast, we can vary just the Fourier number and do just 10 experiments. So if we wanted to experimentally derive this, we wouldn't want to adjust the alpha and L separately because they're not independent. But the Fourier number is. So we can do an experiment where we say the cook time as a function of just the Fourier number. And that is a very intelligent way to set up experiments. So that's another value of non-dimensionalizing number. So the book gives equations of motion in an example where they use the initial position, gravity, parameters, or collapse into one parameter. It's a good equation to understand and a good process to go through. And that gives us the Froude number. Okay, And the Froude number is a ratio of the forces acting on a falling body. Okay, So the Fourier number, as we mentioned before, was a ratio of time scales. The time scale of time that's passing versus the time scale of the 
cook uh, of the time to diffuse into the roast of the temperature to diffuse into the roast so the time of cooking or the time that we see for the problem over the time it takes for temperature to move inside the roast so a ratio of time scales and again the frown number is a ratio of forces that's what a lot of these dimensionless numbers are and we derived them from doing these non-dimensional uh, analyses and they're so useful we can use them now in solving and quantifying problems so for example the way we determine whether flow is laminar or turbulent is based solely on the Reynolds number. We don't do length or velocity, even though it's related to those things, because they're all dependent variables. Rather, what we do is we relate the turbulence to the Reynolds number. Okay, And those numbers came from this non-dimensionalization and analysis of equations. So there's real power to doing this. It's a very different technique. But you'll notice in very complicated books, when you get to your transport class, if you do grad school, the nuclear equation, uh, heat transfer equations, often what they'll do for complicated equations in more than one dimension is they will do this non-dimensionalizing of the equation so that they can determine something reasonable. So you will see this technique again. Uh, and I wanted you to be sure that you understood non-dimensionalization and scaling. So please go through this example, make sure you understand the pieces, and then practice on the problem. Don't just copy this for doing the problem, but make sure that you try and understand the steps and try and do that for the homework problem with the boundary layer equation. It's important for you to know how to do that so you can recognize when other people are doing it and so that you can say something intelligent about complicated problems. Because I guarantee you, be it in your job as an engineer, or in grad school, if you're choosing that route, that there will come a time where you will need to know something about equation and you don't have the time, resources, or know how to solve that equation. And this non-dimensionalization is a great way around that. So uh, hopefully that's clear. If not, again, please send me emails. I did get a few emails about the, um, about the last lecture and or homework. And I do appreciate that because I want you guys to make sure you understand it. So please send me questions. I will be in office hours tomorrow morning at 10. So you can come talk to me then if you have confusion. And uh, with that, good luck. Thanks, guys. Hope you're doing well. I'll talk to you later. Bye.